Greetings, fellow nerds. This is the science video. If you're looking for how all of this relates to the third secret, go back and watch part three. Before we begin, a few disclaimers. I've said before that I'm not a physics major. While I also have no meaningful background in geology, anthropology, seismology, paleomagnetism, sedimentology, astrology, heliophysics, or galactic astrophysics. I have read all of the books and most of the studies I'm going to be throwing up on the screen, and I've done my best to check sources and to gain a decent understanding of this, but after a year of research, I have come to the conclusion that I have nothing of value to add to the conversation as far as the science goes. So I'm going to present the evidence and the explanations that these scientists provide as they present them, along with any background information that I think would be helpful, but I can't meaningfully comment on their validity. The best I can do is try to figure out how popular or well accepted these ideas are in the scientific community, and that's going to be based on my impression from a few days of web searches, so take it for what it's worth. Now, Ben doesn't have a formal background in these fields either. And I have been fooled before by people who sound like they know what they're talking about. Cough, cough, harp report. But he has published papers with other scientists who do have that kind of background. Some have given talks at his conferences. And he gives the impression that he often reaches out to the authors of the studies he reads, either for clarity or to provide a sanity check for some idea he's throwing around. And he's good about limiting himself to the subjects he's actually studied and to what the data says, which is one of the marks of a true scholar. He does make mistakes, and don't we all, but he definitely looks like an honest seeker. And the enormous body of studies and documents I've seen him parse over the last year and a half are a testament to his talent as a researcher and analyst. He also has a 22-page works cited sheet on his website, so I'm not saying take his word for it or anything, but he's more than worth hearing out. Okay, one more disclaimer before we start. About half of the evidence in favor of this relates to the fact that it appears to have happened before, and on a regular basis, about every 12,000 years. I am aware of the debate in the Christian community of how old the world is, or when did time begin, and was the universe created in a state of motion and Adam and Eve were just dropped in, and was Eden actually a garden in the Middle East, or was it in another dimension or on Mars? I'm not going to get into any of that. I'm just going to go over the geology and the anthropology as it's commonly accepted, and you can fit it into your own paradigm however you want. And I think the most logical way to do this will be to go through each scientist who's talked about this chronologically, and to cover the relevant bits of science along the way. So, here we go. It looks like the first mainstream geologists to write about the geological evidence for this kind of a catastrophe were Jean-Andre de Luc and Diodat Dolomieu in the 1700s. In fact, Dolomieu was so famous that Napoleon Bonaparte, when he conquered Italy in 1801, one of the terms of the Treaty of Florence was that they released Dolomieu immediately because he was being held as a prisoner of war. I don't have either of their works, but they are both cited in our first major source, Essay on the Theory of the Earth by Baron Georges Cuvier in 1827. It's a 600-page, very dry geology textbook, but the gist of it is that there seems to be these back-and-forth cycles of large chunks of land rising and sinking into the ocean. He didn't have a theory on how it happened, he just outlined the evidence for it. Following in his footsteps was William Bassett Walker with Cyclical Deluges in 1871. He went over most of the same evidence, with particular emphasis on the coal fields in the polar regions. Now, he had a theory on how this worked. To try to sum it up, he believed there's a gradual migration of the Earth's equinoxes and solstices because the axis relative to the sun gradually changes in a 25,000 year cycle, which is a real thing, it's called apsidal precession, and that this caused a slight change in the Earth's center of gravity over time, which caused water to move from one hemisphere to the other, from north to south or south to north. And as the water accumulated in one of the hemispheres, it would freeze in the polar region, and the ice cap would gradually get bigger, which would also change the Earth's center of gravity very slightly, until it hit a breaking point and the ice caps detached from the crust, which throws off the center of gravity dramatically, disrupting the axis of rotation and causing earthquakes, floods, storms, and volcanoes. All of that is complete nonsense, but he was a geologist, not a physicist. The first sane theory was proposed by a Jesuit, believe it or not, Father Damien Kreuschgard, in The Question of the Equator in Geology in 1902. This one I haven't actually read because it's in German and I can't find a translation, but I am told that he was the first person to propose the idea of crustal displacement in order to explain the fossil evidence of tropical flora and fauna at the poles. And I guess this is as good a time as any to talk about it, because I'm not going to go into too much detail. I haven't checked all of these citations myself, but there are a few recent examples I can include. There are bits of evidence in this direction in other places, but it's most pronounced in the polar regions. For example, there's fossilized coral reefs in the Arctic Circle, They've found fossilized footprints of reptiles at the South Pole, cold-blooded creatures that require environmental heat in order to live, and vast boneyards of warm-blooded creatures in northern Siberia and Alaska, 
broken and mashed together in a frozen muck like they were swept up in a giant wave. If the planet had been uniformly warm enough to support that kind of thing at the polar regions, then the equator would have been too hot to support life, and the fossil record contradicts that, or so the claim goes. Some papers don't see a problem with that idea, and again, I'm not versed in the basic principles of geology, much less do I have an awareness of the complete body of work relevant to assessing these claims. At the same time, there's evidence of glaciation at places on the equator, like South America and Africa and India. If the planet had been uniformly cold enough that the equator was icing over, then almost nothing would have survived. Temperature isn't the only thing that needs to be explained. They found evidence of heavy forestation within 200 miles of the geographic South Pole. That area has six months of consecutive darkness a year, followed by six months of sunlight. The kind of plants that they found there cannot survive that. Similarly, they found prehistoric frozen trees in Spitzenberg, Norway that had no rings. Generally, the only place where trees don't have rings is at the equator, where there are no seasons. Taken altogether, it seems like the current poles must have been at the equator at some point. Now, there are alternative explanations for each of these things. Some of them get a little bit creative. The most common one is continental drift over the course of hundreds of millions of years. Well, just a few months ago, there were a few articles analyzing ice cores out of Greenland and the northern coast of Canada, and they found evidence of plants from within the last few million years to within the last hundred thousand years. Even at the far end, that is much faster than what is conventionally recognized as continental drift. In this particular example, we're talking about lichen, dwarf birch, and possibly fir trees. I don't know if they could survive without the light, but currently they can't survive those temperatures. This might also be a good time to mention that Ben's catch-all explanation for things like carbon dating shows that the ice at the South Pole has been there for millions of years is that radiocarbon dating sucks. At least when you start getting into the thousands of years range. That sounds like a cop-out, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's untrue. There are two examples he likes to bring up of things that were carbon dated and then later redated using a better method that changed age dramatically. One is the Wolf's Creek Crater in Australia that was originally thought to be 300,000 years old, that they revised to be at most 137,000, and a Tibetan ice cap that they thought was over 500,000 years old that they revised to be as little as 15,000. I try to avoid leaning on data integrity arguments like that, but sometimes it's all you've got. Although in the specific example of the age of the ice caps, there are other explanations. Not all of the ice would necessarily melt. There are glaciers at the equator now that still haven't melted because of the altitude they're at. Anyway, back to the boring history. There were a few other people in the 1900s who talked about it. Emanuel Velkovsky, David Talbot, Ting Yin Ma, Frank Hibben. But we're going to skip ahead to the good stuff. World in Peril by Ken White, son of Colonel Maynard E. White, unit commander for Project Nanook an early Cold War era operation to learn how to navigate over the North Pole in order to better combat a Russian threat that might come from that direction. Project Nanook was declassified in 1988, and Ken published his book in 1994 using a combination of declassified materials and the testimony of his father on what they found. This one's a fun read if you're into military stories. Most of it is just the challenges they faced trying to fly airplanes in minus 50 degree weather in areas where the compass didn't work correctly. The money shot is in chapters 28 to 30. While they were up there, they noticed that the magnetic north pole had moved significantly since the last time they checked it. It appeared to be moving in the direction of the geographic north pole. This concerned the scientists, and they asked themselves what would happen if the magnetic pole ended up in the same place as the geographic pole. So they contracted who else but the Rand Corporation to figure this out for them. And it says they put together some kind of a model of the Earth using concentric spheres. And it doesn't give details, but it says what happened was the magnetic pole did indeed continue to move toward the geographic pole, orbiting it at increasing speed as if pulled by centripetal force. Then when the two finally met, it flew off 89 degrees to the equator, as if by centrifugal force. And then the crust started sliding until the two roughly coincided again, basically resulting in a 90 degree flip of both the geographic and magnetic poles. In the model, it did this because their crust was magnetized. Now, the Earth's crust is a bit magnetized, but probably not enough to break it off from the asthenosphere like that. But we're moving in the right direction. This is definitely the best theory so far. And there's some actual laboratory modeling behind it. I should mention that Ken doesn't cite any declassified documents in this section of the book. This is all from his father's testimony. I tried to find some declassified files on Project Nanook myself, but Google and the Department of Defense website aren't bringing up anything. I'd probably have to put in a FOIA request. But this all seems plausible, and the photographs provided are enough to show that this isn't a complete fabrication. 
During a scientific meeting at the Pentagon, it was discussed how the flip phenomenon would cause a cooling effect, followed by a bilateral contraction of the Earth and the formation of another ring of mountain ranges around the planet. By counting the existing chains of mountain ranges of this type on land and within the oceans, they concluded that at least five major polar flips of this sort had occurred in fairly recent geologic history. At the time, they believed the next flip could occur as early as 1964. Obviously, that would be worrying to them, and it sounds like they were taking it fairly seriously. Colonel White talks about a Pentagon meeting he attended in early 1948, where they were discussing whether or not to release this information to the public. They didn't, of course, but he also mentions that in the early 1950s, there was a newspaper column and a magazine article that talked about this flip theory, and nobody seemed to care. I'm not sure, but he might be talking about this article from Robert Plum that appeared in the New York Times and Time magazine in 1948. It was discussing the work of Hugh Auchincloss Brown, who had written an essay that year titled Popular Awakening Concerning the Impending Flood, which I think was publicly released in 51. His theory didn't involve the magnetic poles, though. It was basically identical to our next source. Earth Shifting Crust by Charles Hapgood, 1958. Yes, that guy from the movie 2012. I kind of skimmed this one because it's mostly the same evidence that Ken White and Cuvier put forward in their books, but this is where Albert Einstein gets involved. Hapgood sent him a pre-published copy of the book to solicit his opinion, and he found the geological evidence very compelling. In fact, he said, One can hardly doubt that significant shifts of the crust of the Earth have taken place repeatedly and within a short time. The empirical material you have compiled would hardly permit another interpretation. He ended up writing a foreword to the book, but he expressed some doubts about the mechanism Hapgood came up with. Basically, it was a crustal displacement version of Walker's theory. Ice accumulates unevenly at the poles over time, and eventually the imbalance is strong enough to overpower the friction between the crust and the mantle, causing it to slide. He focused mainly on the lopsided shape of the Antarctic ice, and on Greenland, which is relatively small, but it's much further from the axis and it has no counterbalance. It's also imbalanced in the same direction Antarctica is, so they would work together to move the planet in the same direction. There are two problems with this theory. The first is that the weight of the ice just isn't strong enough to do that by itself. Hapgood eventually realized this, and in 1970 he released another book called The Path of the Pole, acknowledging this problem and that he really had no satisfactory explanation for how this could work. But he did have a neat idea. He thought that maybe there were massive structures in the crust itself, or just below it, that were being moved around by subterranean processes and contributing to this imbalance. He also talked about the fact that the Earth isn't just an oblate spheroid, but it's actually slightly elongated on the equator. That there are these bumps and irregular lumps in various places that create sort of a third axis. He was onto something here. He didn't know what because the technology to detect it didn't exist at the time, but we'll come back to this idea. He did nothing to address the second problem with his theory, though. Every time the crust shifted, a different landmass would end up at the poles in a different orientation. This means that the ice would accumulate differently each time, and therefore the direction of the imbalance would be different each time. Remember, ice that's in the ocean has no effect on this. Only ice that's connected to the crust could cause it to slide. He also believed that the crust would only slide until the ice broke up from all of the earthquakes, and that this would happen at different points every time. It might move 45 degrees, or 20, or 60, or 90, and this is not what the paleomagnetic or geological evidence show. This is ultimately what was used to debunk him. There's significant evidence that shows that the poles were in the same place that they are now millions of years ago. So the only way for crustal displacement to work is if the poles go back to where they are now pretty regularly. The 90 degree flip proposed by the Rand Corporation and Chan Thomas can make that work. Hapgood's theory cannot. Now, during World War II, Hapgood worked for the Office of the Coordinator of Information, which later became known as the Office of Strategic Services, which is a name you might recognize because later they became the CIA. He officially left after the war, but I think it's fair to say that working in counterintelligence is a lot like being in the mob. You never really get out. Ben has a theory about this. He thinks that Hapgood's book was a straw man, an intentionally bad theory intended to discredit catastrophism and draw the attention of the scientific community away. That's plausible. Certainly they've done things like that before. But I'm skeptical. First of all, this presumes that catastrophism was gaining enough attention that they thought that it needed to be dealt with. Now, I can't claim to know what was in scientific vogue in the 1950s. But if the material we've covered so far is the complete body of work on this subject, and this is pretty much everything I've heard Ben cite, that doesn't seem like much of a threat. 
On the other hand, Einstein did mention in one of his letters that he had heard about this theory before and just never really given it much thought, so maybe it was being talked about at the time. But even so, by soliciting Einstein to endorse the book, they probably brought more attention and credibility to catastrophism than anything else ever has. I think a more prudent strategy would have been to just gaslight it into submission, like they do with climate science and pharmacology these days. Though I will say that if they were trying to discredit this, they couldn't have picked a better guy. Some of Hapgood's other books include Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, which is about Atlantis, and Voices of the Spirit, through the psychic experience of Elwood Babbitt, which is about a trance medium that studied under Edgar Cayce and claimed to be channeling lectures from Jesus, Albert Einstein, Mark Twain, and the Hindu god Vishnu. Pretty easy target there. So, CIA shill or kind of a kook who happened to be in the right place at the wrong time? I guess it really doesn't matter. One way or another, I imagine the CIA noticed him. Which brings us back to where we started. The Adam and Eve story by Chauncey P. Thomas. Just five years after Hapgood. The book gets its title from his pet theory that Adam and Eve were survivors of a previous catastrophe, and that Genesis is a history of those events that got mixed up over the ages. Yes, I know, that's the ending of Assassin's Creed 2. He says he began research for the book in 1949. That's one year after the interview with Hugh Brown was published in the New York Times, so that might have been what got him interested. Incidentally, they were both electrical engineers. I wonder if they knew each other. Either way, he does cite him in the book, so he was definitely an influence. The book got three print runs from 1963 to 1965 when the CIA classified it. Then he released another book called Postlude to the Adam and Eve Story in 1971. This one focused a lot more on the science. In fact, the original is the least scientific of anything we've talked about so far. All of it is on pages 7 to 17. The other 40 pages are him interpreting the Bible and other ancient stories to connect them to the cataclysm. This one got two print runs, and as far as we can tell, it was never classified. Then in 1993, he re-released The Adam and Eve Story, under the title The Adam and Eve Story, The History of Cataclysms, with the postlude added in as a new chapter titled Cataclysms Revisited, along with a second book called Aftermath of the Adam and Eve Story, adding some new information and going on tangential rants about subjects such as angels and UFOs, ESP, tooth decay, abuse of women, Vietnam, corruption in the U.S. government and the destruction of the Constitution, the Federal Reserve, the Spanish Inquisition, evolution, and illegal immigrants. The whole thing is functionally equivalent to a Reddit post. But these don't seem to have gotten classified either, despite containing the full text of the original still classified book. Why not? Let's start by going over his theory and how it differed from Hapgood and Brown. As I mentioned before, he believed that it was a 90 degree flip each time. He gives a bunch of locations for where the poles have been, but they basically go back and forth between the same two areas. So that solves one problem with Hapgood's theory. Now, Chan Thomas had read Hapgood, he mentions him in the book, and his theory incorporates the same idea of the polar ice being imbalanced and gravitating toward the equator, dragging the crust with it. Like Einstein, he realized that it wasn't heavy enough to do that by itself. But instead of doing what Hapgood did and trying to fix it by adding more mass to the crust, he approached it from the other angle. What if you could reduce the friction? He proposed that every few thousand years, at an irregular interval, something happened that, for a brief period, changed the electromagnetic environment of the low seismic shear wave velocity zone, the thin red line here in his diagram, between the lithosphere and the asthenosphere, such that it reduced its plasticity and allowed it to flow freely like a liquid, even to the point of serving as a lubricant for the sliding of the crust. Now that is the first theory we've heard so far that might actually work. It is a known property of some substances that changing the net magnetic field they're in will change their viscosity or plasticity. I'm throwing a bunch of studies on the screen just to give you an idea, but it looks like generally if you decrease the net magnetic field effect, you decrease the viscosity and plasticity, and vice versa. This is called magnetohydrodynamics, and it was first proposed by electrical engineer and plasma physicist Hans Alfain in 1942. He won the Nobel Prize for it. So this was fairly cutting-edge stuff. Now, magnetohydrodynamism only applies to electrically conductive fluids, like plasma, liquid metals, salt water, and electrolytes. But that works in our favor because it turns out one of the defining characteristics of the low velocity zone is that it's highly conductive. It's also already a relatively low viscosity region, and it's believed that this is because it's partially melted. In other words, fluid. This appears to have been at least partially confirmed last year using seismic tomology. So while it is theoretical whether or not the low-velocity zone would be subject to magnetohydrodynamism, it seems like a good bet. Side note, I don't know if Chan Thomas even knew any of this. The low-velocity zone wasn't discovered until 1959. In fact, he doesn't use that term in his book at all because it probably wasn't codified yet. 
but he does specify that region between 60 and 120 miles down. He also didn't know about the Rand Corporation's theory connecting all of this to the movement of the magnetic poles, because Project Nanook wasn't declassified yet. He wouldn't make that connection until his final book in 1993, just five years before he died. Okay, so assuming that you can reduce the plasticity of the low velocity zone this way, how would you change the magnetic environment? What causes that? In the original classified version, Chan Thomas gave a three sentence theory on this. Quote, so apparently every few thousand years, neutral matter escapes from the 860 mile radius inner core to the 1300 mile thick molten outer core, and there is a literal atomic explosion inside the Earth. The explosion in the high energy layer of the outer core disrupts completely the electrical and magnetic structure in both the molten outer core and the outer 60 mile thick molten layer. Finally, the ice caps are allowed to pull the shell of the Earth around the interior, with the shallow molten layer lubricating the shift all the way. End quote. Yes, I know that's the ending of the core. It's also really dumb. And I think he realized that pretty quickly, because six years later he released a much better theory in the postlude. That the solar system passes through galactic magnetic null zones, or reversal zones, where the galaxy's magnetic field changes from one polarity to the other. In 1970, I probably would have called this a hand-wavy explanation. But given what we've learned in the intervening decades and what we're observing right now, well, we'll come back to that. Returning to the question you've been asking this entire time, why did this get classified? The CIA's page doesn't tell us, but there are a few things we can glean from it. First of all, in Ben's initial video on this, he made a couple of mistakes that I don't think he's ever publicly corrected, so I want to clear that up just in case anyone goes back and watches the old stuff. He said this was declassified in response to a FOIA request from someone. That is not the case. This was automatically declassified as part of the Crest 25-year program archive. You can tell because the document type is Crest and it doesn't have a FOIA case number. As you can see in this example, if it had been a FOIA request, the document type would be FOIA and there would be a case number. This is explained on their search help page. I don't blame him for not finding it because it took me a year to find. This is not an intuitively designed website. Now if you're paying attention, you might be asking why was something that was classified in 1966 declassified in 2013 if this is a 25-year program? That's over 50 years. The answer is, I think that's how far behind they are. This program didn't get started until 2006. But this also seems to have something to do with how these things are physically stored. If you look at the document number, it tells you a few things about it. The first two digits tell you when it was transferred to the National Archives and Records Administration, so in this case 1979. The next set of numbers are the job number, box number, and folder number it was in. You can do a wildcard search on their website and see everything that was in the same physical box as this document. Their classification dates range from 1952 all the way to 1971, but all of them were declassified during the same time period in 2013. So it looks like they're just going through these sequentially by box. By the way, the document creation date, December 2016, that corresponds to when the Crest website was created. Prior to that, you had to go to a physical terminal at the National Archives in order to read this. His other mistake was he thought the version the CIA released was heavily redacted, that the original was 284 pages and that there were pages missing, like 8 and 18. We've since learned that it wasn't, because we actually found copies of the original book. A digital copy at a library in Exeter, Tasmania, and a physical copy at the Pennsylvania County Library in Virginia. Gary Long filmed himself going through the physical copy in Virginia page by page, and as you can see, pages 8 and 18 are blank. That's why they aren't in the CIA's PDF. They don't scan blank pages. Now, in his defense, the release decision is RIPPUB, which means release in part public, and it does say right in the file, declassified in part, sanitized copy. Now, I haven't been through it word by word, but I have been through it paragraph by paragraph, and I don't see anything missing. They might be talking about this note on the front cover, for Art L from, and whoever's name it was, looks like it has a piece of tape over it or something. There's a similar box in the bottom right corner of this cross section of Earth. Maybe it's covering up another note. Or maybe they've removed some of the other materials from the file. There's a Time Magazine article from 1966 and what looks like some kind of inventory form randomly shoved in there. Based on the way these are scanned, I assume that means that these articles were stuffed in between those pages of the book. Maybe someone was using them as a bookmark. But they're basically in the front and back cover, so that seems unlikely. Maybe there were more such articles and they removed those. The last useful field is the classification level. The choices are top secret, secret, confidential, restricted, unclassified, and K for unknown, which is what this one is. I guess it's kind of a catch-all classification. Doesn't really tell us much. So what was the reason? 
Ben's theory is that it got in the way of the CIA's plan to discredit this theory. Hapgood had released his straw man argument seven years earlier with Einstein's backing, but this wasn't enough time to thoroughly debunk it. So in 1965, when Chan Thomas presented a theory that actually worked, the first to ever publicly incorporate the magnetic aspect, they had to cover it up. After Brown released Cataclysms of the Earth in 1967, and Hapgood released Path of the Poles in 1970, they felt they had put the last nail in the coffin of this theory, and so they didn't care that Chan Thomas released a postlude in 1971, or that he re-released the entire book in 1993. They felt that catastrophism had been discredited enough that the scientific community wouldn't pay any attention to it, and nobody else would notice. That's... plausible. But I have a much more mundane theory. I think somebody mailed the CIA a copy of this book and that it got filed into the classified archives for purely bureaucratic reasons. Why would I think that? Well, there was this thing called FBI Memorandum 6751. It was a letter sent to the FBI claiming that UFOs were actually from another dimension, not from outer space. I've seen people cite this as evidence that this is what the FBI believed, or that they were entertaining this idea. That may be the case, but this is not evidence of that. If you look through the rest of the file, it's filled with all kinds of UFO sightings and random things that were mailed to them. This isn't here because they regarded it as credible, it's here because they were archiving everything. In fact, the person who wrote the letter outright says he doesn't expect to be taken seriously, because the source of the information was supernatural. Now, remember I said you could do a wildcard search on the CIA's website and look at all of the other documents that were in the same physical box as Adam and Eve's story? You may not have caught it, but if you look at them, almost all of them are related to UFO photography. And not the good kind that comes from military aircraft. This is stuff that people mailed to them, including some really obviously fake ones, and their analysis of it suggests that they believed as much. I think that this was a junk folder or at best the CIA equivalent of the X-Files, a place where they shoved weird things that nobody really took seriously. That's the Occam's Razor. This explains why we had no trouble finding a copy of the book, because its publication was never actually suppressed. It explains why the classification level was unknown. It explains why nothing else related to this was ever classified. It explains why Chan Thomas's other books were never classified. And it explains why there's a random Time Magazine article and an inventory form shoved into the file. Because it was regarded as junk. They probably weren't even aware of the Pentagon and the Rand Corporation's involvement with this theory, because at that particular point in history, compartmentalization would likely have prevented that. And I know that sounds really deflating, but remember, we still have Colonel White's testimony that the Pentagon was taking this fairly seriously in the 40s. They also would have taken notice of Albert Einstein lending support to this theory in a book by one of their former employees, Hapgood. So even if they didn't think Chan Thomas's book was worth suppressing, that doesn't mean they didn't think the theory had any value. For now, let's get to the real science, and we'll kick it off with something a little exciting. The Earth's magnetic field is fading. There are articles on NASA's website from as early as 2001 stating that the Earth's magnetic field has been weakening at a rate of 5% per century, and that it had been recently updated to 7% per century. In 2003, they told us how far we'd progressed, saying, globally the magnetic field had weakened by 10% since the 19th century. In 2006, a study came out saying that we had been losing 5% per century since 1840, which more or less lines up with the NASA article. When they said the 19th century, they almost certainly meant 1840 as well, because we didn't invent a way to measure magnetic field intensity until 1837, and we didn't start keeping records until 1840. So 5% per century for 160 years is about 8%. That's close to 10%. And we don't know exactly when it changed from 5% per century to 7% per century, so that more or less lines up. Then in 2010, the European Space Agency said that in the last 150 years we had lost 15% of the field strength. That's an extra 5% in just 10 years. Then in a study in 2014, they confirmed this was not a mistake. Previously, researchers estimated the field was weakening by 5% per century, but the new data revealed the field is actually weakening at 5% per decade, or 10 times faster than thought. Now that's measured using the SWARM satellites. A recent study from the World Data Center using ground-based measurements says it's less than that, 2.3% between 1980 and 2011. But they agree that it was 5% per century before, so that's still an acceleration. Has the rate of decay accelerated since then? In 2020, there was a study confirming that it has accelerated in the Pacific region, and that the South Atlantic anomaly, the weakest spot in the field, is starting to split into two lobes. But measuring field strength is more complicated than that. See, it's actually getting weaker and stronger constantly in individual places from year to year. It's called the secular variation. But when you combine everything, the overall net strength is weakening. At least, I assume that's what they mean. I haven't actually found anyone who explicitly says that, but that's the impression I get. Anyway, the pink is it getting stronger and the blue is it getting weaker. 
So having that ordinary variation increase at a rate of 30 nanoteslas per year in that one region is not indicative of an acceleration in the weakening of the overall field strength. As you can see from this animation, regional accelerations of that same strength have been happening in both directions for the last 20 years, which leaves us with no idea how fast the field is weakening right now. There haven't been any further updates in terms of percentage lost. It should be possible to just download the swarm data and make a spreadsheet of month-by-month -month field readings in nanoteslas, then add them all together and graph it. And I've tried to do that, but I don't know what I'm looking at here. And I assume Ben doesn't know how to do this either, because if he did, he would absolutely be putting this out every month. So the best I've got are these little heat maps they publish. It looks like between 2014 and 2020, the greatest loss was over North America, 750 nanoteslas. I tried using the Photoshop fill tool to figure out what the field strength was over that part of North America, but the gradient on this PNG isn't granular enough, so I can't do any real math with this. We have a proxy we can look at, though. It's universally agreed that the weakening of the field is tied to the movement of the magnetic poles. The South Pole has already left Antarctica, and the North Pole has just passed the geographic North Pole heading towards Siberia. The rate of that acceleration looks like it's kind of leveled off. As of 2020, the North Pole is still moving at 50 to 60 kilometers per year. Incidentally, they're both moving toward the place that Chan Thomas pegged as the new North Pole, which happens to be on the opposite side of the world as the South Atlantic Anomaly. Now, it's worth noting that the magnetic field is not like a planetary health bar. There really is no such thing as 100% field strength. We just picked 1840 as our 100% level because that's when we started taking measurements, and because it was shortly after that that the weakening started to really accelerate. Supposedly, the million-year average field strength is half of that. It's also worth noting that all of the field readings before 1840 are based in paleomagnetic data, which means they looked at bits of magnetized rocks and tried to figure out how old they were in order to determine how strong the field was and where the magnetic pole was at the time. As you might expect, there are a lot of confounding factors in that data that are difficult to parse out, especially if you believe that the poles are moving 90 degrees every few thousand years. So I'm not saying it's worthless, but it might be off by more than one standard deviation. So, why is the field weakening? We don't know. Some people think this is the beginning of a pole flip, but the general consensus seems to be that this doesn't match what we historically have seen from the paleomagnetic data before a pole flip. The field strength could level off or it could start going up again. But it's also acknowledged that this could go on for a while. We could end up getting down to half of what the 1840 field strength was even if this isn't a reversal or an excursion. And that's probably a low enough to make it impossible to maintain an electrical grid, at least one of the current design and to our standards of reliability. And if it is a reversal or an excursion, that's even worse. During the Lachamp excursion, for example, they think it got down as low as 10 or 20 percent. Now, there are two things that could be causing this. Either something is happening with the outer core, which is what generates the field, and that's pretty much the universally accepted theory. Or, there could be another magnetic field that's being applied to us at a planetary scale that's changing. Which brings us back to Chan Thomas's theory about galactic magnetic null zones. Or, more specifically, the galactic current sheet. And this is where I'm the most over my head. In fact, this is the second time I'm recording this because I got it wrong the first time, so take this with a grain of salt. Let's start by talking about the Sun's current sheet, because we know how that works. The Sun has a magnetic field, north and south, like the Earth, except much more chaotic. The major difference is that the Sun is constantly releasing jets of plasma in the form of the solar wind. Since it's spinning while it does this, the plasma comes out in spirals. It's usually compared to a sprinkler. If the sprinkler is spinning as the jets of water come out, it forms a spiral of water. And because the plasma is electrically charged, the sun's magnetic field bends toward this spiral, and at the same time, the plasma moves to conform to the magnetic field. They affect each other. And the result is this rippling shape called a Parker spiral. This is also part of magnetohydrodynamics, except instead of fluid, this is plasma. And I think this phenomenon is called the Parker instability, which is a particular form of plasma instability, a magnetic buoyancy that involves magnetically charged particles interacting with magnetic fields and moving both of them. The description sounds like the same thing, but I'm not sure. I've heard Ben call it the Parker spiral instability, so I assume they're at least related. Anyway, this wavy thing is the dividing line between the sun's magnetic fields. On top, the net field effect is north, and on the bottom, it's south. Half of the time, the sun's magnetic field actually flips every 11 years. So, just like when you run an electric current through something, you generate a magnetic field, if you move a magnetic field through a field of charged particles, you generate a current running through those particles. And that's what the current sheet is. Because physics, the current gets compressed into this thin area between the two fields. And by thin, I mean 10,000 kilometers thick. 
The sun goes through one full rotation about every 28 days, and as a result of that, we pass through one of those ripples every week or so, 7 to 10 days. And just like it induces currents in the plasma, this can induce currents in the Earth's atmosphere and the ground. Sometimes it even causes small geomagnetic storms. But it's small and it doesn't do very much. Now, the galaxy has a magnetic field too. This is universally agreed upon. It also seems to be pretty well accepted that that field is shaped at least in part by the Parker instability. The theoretical part seems to be whether or not it's shaped like a Parker spiral, such that there would be these undulations going across the midplane of the galactic disk, switching us occasionally from the north side to the south side, and vice versa, and whether or not there's a current sheet. It sounds like a perfectly reasonable theory. We see it on a small scale in laboratories and at the solar system level, so why not at the galactic level? The galactic core does emit charged particles. Now, I've seen a few studies suggesting the existence of local current sheets in the galaxy, and there has been some recent observational evidence in that direction, but this seems like a theory that not many people are talking about. That's what I got out of my brief attempt at researching this anyway. It has much broader implications as far as how galaxies are formed, which impacts everything all the way up to theories on how the universe was created, like the Big Bang. And as you may be aware, that's one of those hot button issues where certain preferred theories are given grant money and other theories are pushed to the sidelines. So the most popular theory is not necessarily the one that most people think has the most merit or that has the most successful modeling. Not that science is a democracy. It's just consensus is the lazy shortcut for those of us without the time or talent to make a real assessment. So Ben's theory is that this is a double layer current sheet. And I don't think he's ever explained why. I don't think there's even agreement that the sun's current sheet is double layer. I'm also not sure if it makes any difference. Anyway, he thinks it's between 60 and 170 parsecs tall, and it takes about 500 years to pass through it. He thinks that we entered into it around 1859, because that's when the North Pole suddenly changed direction and started beelining for the opposite side of the planet. That's when the Earth's magnetic field started weakening, and that's when the Carrington event happened, all at basically the same time. So he thinks we're about 20 to 40 years from hitting the middle of it, which is where the bad stuff happens. Although he's also said that exiting the current sheet could be the trigger, because of the heavy ion density on the trailing end. He thinks that we pass through it about every 12,000 years. The reason for that is because it looks like we have a magnetic excursion every 12,000 years or so, and these periods also happen to line up with major extinction events, volcanic events, meteor impacts, and mini ice ages. Again, this is based on paleomagnetic data, so the dating and even existence of some of these events is kind of debatable. And then there's the universal our dating methods suck argument that's intrinsic to this whole theory. So this chart isn't as strong as it looks, but the fact that it's even possible to line all of these things up like that is still pretty compelling. By the way, you'll occasionally see him mention a 6,000 year half cycle. He's recently started calling it the Heinrich Bond cycle after this paper connecting solar activity to the Heinrich events, which are when large groups of icebergs break off of glaciers and melt, causing major climate changes. That's part of how you get the mini ice ages. He doesn't really have a solid theory on what causes these. The idea has been floated that the current sheet actually hits every 6,000 years, and for some reason the polarity change in one direction just isn't as bad as the change in the other direction, so it doesn't trigger the nova. But we don't really know. There just appears to be a 6,000 year disaster harmonic of some kind. So, our passage through the current sheet is changing the magnetic environment of the solar system, weakening our planet's magnetic field, and thus lowering the plasticity of the low velocity zone, allowing the crust to eventually unlock. Now, if that is actually the case, then we should be seeing the same kind of changes on the other planets, right? Well, I don't feel like going down this list, so I'm just going to steal a clip from Ben. Venus, fastest winds are getting faster. A relative change on Earth would have us with 300 mile per hour hurricanes and tornadoes. It's also changing its rotation speed, much more than Earth's recent millisecond speed up. After warming faster than Earth, InSight has now begun detecting increases in seismic activity on Mars, and they say these increases are unexplainable. Jupiter lost a stripe. It witnessed the birth of a new superstorm, and most importantly, the radio emission from its magnetic field is changing. The 30-year storm on Saturn came over a decade early, first time since it was first spotted with scopes in the 1800s. Saturn is also changing its rotation speed, despite the incredulity of even some of the scientists on the team. Uranus and Neptune saw record storms and even auroral displays, but what recently happened on Neptune would be like tropical systems forming in the Caribbean and heading east to Africa. Not possible without a major planetary change. And of course, there is Pluto. It was checked and rechecked and, yep, it lost a fifth of its atmosphere as of the latest, a 2019 reading. But while they initially believed it had occurred in three years, which is a disaster, the 2018 process data now shows no decrease, meaning they lost 20% of their atmosphere in only one year. 
the collapse of Pluto, the reversal of Neptunian storms, changing rotation rates, changing magnetic field radio production, changing winds, storms, aurora, and seismicity, all tied to electromagnetism that would get worked if those other planets are undergoing their magnetic cycle events, just like we are. The bit about Pluto is interesting. The implication is that its magnetic field has completely collapsed and now its atmosphere is being stripped off by the solar wind. We don't actually know if Pluto has a magnetic field. It's generally expected that it wouldn't because it's a small frozen rock. But there are other small frozen rocks that do, like Jupiter's moon Ganymede. There is expected to be some change in Pluto's atmosphere normally. When it gets to the far end of its orbit, they think it actually gets so cold that nitrogen in the air freezes and comes down as ice. But they were expecting that to cause a pressure change of 1%, not 20%. So the working theories are either they've grossly underestimated the degree to which that happens, the reading is bogus, or the magnetic field has collapsed. Its magnetic field would be weaker than the other planets, so it would be affected first, other than Mars, which has no field at all. And it happens to be the closest to the galactic center at the moment, so it would be the deepest into the current sheet. Now, since that original reading, there's been another one out of Iran using a different method, and they only found 3% loss of atmosphere. So one of them is likely wrong, but Ben has an idea for how they could actually both work. Maybe its magnetic field isn't quite weak enough that ordinary solar wind is stripping off the atmosphere, but somewhere between August 2018 and July 2019, it was exposed to elevated solar activity, something that was strong enough to penetrate the weakened magnetic field and blow off 20% of the atmosphere. And then during the subsequent 11 months between that and the Iran reading, 17% of the atmosphere was replenished through outgassing from the surface. Either way, it's fairly inconclusive right now. We need some more data. And then there's the sun. Just a few months ago, we saw a study noting a change in the abundance of helium in the solar wind, and they relate it directly to changes in the sun's magnetic field. Are there other ways to explain all of those things? Yes. Is it a big coincidence that every single planet other than Mercury has something going on that can be explained by changes in the magnetic environment? And the only reason Mercury isn't on that list is probably because we have less ways of observing it than the other planets? Also yes. And that covers all of the science up to Chan Thomas. Now we finally come to the modern day, and Ben Davidson's major contribution to this theory. Chan Thomas tried to solve the problem of getting the crust to move by essentially reducing the friction magnetically. That's a big step, but what if it's not enough? What if the imbalance of the polar ice isn't enough to get the crust to start moving, or to keep it moving all the way down to the equator? Ben steps in and says, what if we just gave it a little push? And by push, I mean a rotation glitch. A day on the Earth isn't always exactly 24 hours. Sometimes it varies by a few milliseconds. On average, the days have been getting shorter since at least the 70s. That's how far back this chart goes. Then around the year 2000, that started really picking up speed. Which, if you recall, is about when the weakening of the magnetic field started picking up speed. This is likely a sign that we're getting close to the center of the current sheet. We know that magnetic field strength correlates with the rotation speed of stars, so it would make sense for the Earth as well. And some of these length of day variations or glitches come in patterns. There's a 5 to 8 year oscillation and a quasi 6 year oscillation and multi-decadal oscillations. And the different ones are associated with different things and there are several theories on what causes these. One of the ones they're pretty sure about is that there's relative movement of mass between the core and the mantle and that this results in angular momentum transfer between the core and the mantle. In other words, say the movement of matter in the core slows it down. That change in momentum gets transferred from the core to the mantle, either through pressure differences created by topography at the core mantle boundary, or through some kind of gravitational or electromagnetic coupling, and that causes the mantle and the connected crust to slow down as well, thus changing the length of the day. And they're also pretty confident that changes in the ocean and the atmosphere can affect the rotation speed of the crust, which then filters down through the same exchange of angular momentum to the core. And there's a bunch of other theories like the flow of subcrustal masses, cosmic rays, planetary alignments. But one of the things that's correlated with some but not all length of day glitches is solar activity. When there's an increase in solar activity, it appears to decrease the Earth's rotation speed. There's a lot of papers on this going all the way back to the 1960s, and the correlation is reasonably strong. It's definitely not the cause of all length of day glitches, but I don't really see anybody denying that it causes some of them. It's also associated with the wobbling of the Earth's rotational axis, not the Chandler wobble, the 12 month oscillation. How it does it is debated. Could be the sun affecting the climate, and then the changes in the oceans and the atmosphere do it through angular momentum transfer. But others think it could be direct solar forcing. I found one paper that suggested that either the mantle or the highly conductive low velocity zone were effectively an electric circuit, and that by running a current through it you would create a Lorentz force and apply magnetic torque to it directly. So the idea is, if ordinary solar activity can cause small changes in the rotational velocity, a burst of really big solar activity could cause a significant, relatively dramatic movement. And normally the crust and mantle are locked together, so their momentum changes together as one unit. 
But if the bond was weakened, then that change in momentum might serve as the last little push that would be needed to separate them and set the crust in motion, coming more or less at the lowest point of the Earth's field strength, and thus the weakest level of plasticity at the low velocity zone. And once it starts moving, it causes a cascade effect, because the friction of the sliding will increase the heat, which decreases viscosity, and creates more magma at the low velocity zone, which increases fluidity, thus allowing it to slide easier. And theoretically, the kinetic friction should be less than the static friction, so less energy would be needed to keep it in motion than was needed to get it started, but that's probably negligible. And then from there, it's momentum, and the imbalance of the surface features carry the ice caps down to the equator. There would also be heat coming from the current generated by said solar activity running through the low velocity zone, and that current itself could potentially disrupt the plasticity. In fact, Ben thinks that disruption might be significant enough to cause crustal displacement by itself, even without the galactic change to the magnetic environment. So if it turns out that the current sheet isn't what triggers the nova, or the current sheet isn't changing the plasticity of the low velocity zone by itself, the nova could still do it. This doesn't really work if the sun is using the climate as an intermediary, though. However much energy you throw at the ocean and the atmosphere, you're probably not going to get a very big push. Not that you necessarily need a push. Again, this is just kind of icing on the cake. But if we're going to bother incorporating it into the theory, it might as well be something substantial. But it doesn't necessarily have to be direct solar forcing either. There are other possible intermediaries. One that Ben often talks about is geomagnetic jerks, which is defined as a relatively sudden change in the second derivative of the Earth's magnetic field with respect to time, which means the acceleration of the field change, or secular variation. So the annual change in the field would be nanoteslas per year, which is the first derivative, the rate of change in the field. And the acceleration, or second derivative, would be nanoteslas per year per year, or nanoteslas per year squared, just like kinetic acceleration is meters per second squared. And a geomagnetic jerk is when the nanoteslas per year squared suddenly jumps, in either direction. It can be an acceleration of the field strengthening or weakening. They're mostly regional changes, but some appear to be global. And there are a lot of studies that correlate them with both length of day glitches and solar activity. So theoretically, a super flare or a nova could channel a huge current down to the core and then somehow cause a geomagnetic jerk. It looks like the most common theory is Alfane waves focused on the surface of the core. That's magnetohydrodynamics again. I think it basically means that material in the core flows along the field lines and that results in an exchange of angular momentum all the way up to the crust. Now, is that something that would scale directly with solar activity to give us a huge rotation glitch for a huge solar outburst? I don't know, but it sounds a lot more likely than doing it through solar climate forcing point is there are options besides direct magnetic torque acting on the crust. So we've established that a major solar outburst could be a key component of this mechanism. We believe it to be a micronova rather than a super flare for three reasons. First of all, the cyclical nature of it. Flares go in random directions. Even if the current sheet increased solar activity and caused the sun to start super flaring all over the place, it's relatively unlikely that we'd get hit with that degree of regularity. Second, the impactors. As I mentioned before, there are meteor craters whose dating lines up pretty well with the cycle. A flare would not contain any impactors. And lastly, the isotope evidence. There are a bunch of radioactive isotopes on Earth that could have come from Nova, some of which are embedded in the bones and surge deposits I mentioned in the geology section, but those ones are considered naturally occurring isotopes. So that could be a piece of the puzzle, but as usual, there are other explanations. But some of the isotopes require so much energy to create that it's believed that the only place they could possibly come from would be events like supernovas or stars colliding. Two such examples are aluminum-26 and iron-60. These isotopes have been found on the Earth, on the Moon, and in the local interstellar clouds surrounding our solar system in quantities that it is considered well-established are significantly above the expected normal distribution in the galaxy. The conventional explanation has been, there must have been a nearby supernova some millions of years ago, and we got showered with its ejecta. But just last year, there was a study called Magnetic Imprisonment of Dusty Pinballs by a Supernova Remnant. It presents a model of what happens to the supernova ejecta, the first such model to incorporate the effects of magnetic fields. And according to them, pretty much everything stays trapped in the supernova remnant. Now, that's one model, and we're talking about galactic astrophysics, so it's far from a sure thing. But assuming that's true, then the isotopes could not have come here from a nearby nova because they would not have escaped the remnant. The only way for that to work would be for our solar system to wander directly through the supernova remnant, which indeed is the new theory they put forward. In Antarctica, they found samples of iron-60 that they believe fell to Earth just 20 years ago, so it appears that we're still moving through whatever this is. Ben, of course, suggests that these come from our sun during the micronova. That would explain why they're so evenly distributed, but then it raises the issue of the dating. Pretty much all of these samples are over a million years old, and assuming our sun has been doing this every 12,000 years for millions of years, those isotopes would still be there, but you would think that the samples on the top layer would be a little more fresh. Although apparently that's not true for the moon, since regular impacts are constantly churning up the soil and mixing the layers. 
still, you might have to lean on that data integrity argument again to really explain that. But Ben has made a claim a couple of times trying to rule out the competing theory of a nearby nova. The reason why this may have been the most important story of the year is because Earthbound isotopes dictate recent, nearby nova events. Recent as in way after the Earth formed, due to their short half-lives, and nearby because it would take too long for those dust particles to get across space. It would exhaust the half-life span as well. And now we've got that really big problem, because we know it had to be a recent, nearby nova, but to be that nearby, to be inside the remnant, and for it to have been a star-destroying supernova would mean enough energy to destroy the Earth's biosphere. We'd all be gone. The next thing most people ask is, okay, well, what if it wasn't that strong of a nova? What if it was a smaller nova, the ones you were talking about? Well, then, where is the star? There are no nearby candidates. It would have had to have been a supernova because there's nothing there. It is indeed needed as a star-destroying event. So it must be recent, nearby, but so nearby that we'd all be dead and not watching this video, and supernova level because whatever star that did it isn't out there. And it isn't. It's in here. And it is still here. It's the sun. Unfortunately, he's never shown the math on that claim, so now I have to try to reproduce it for you blindly. At least it's easy math this time. The tricky part is finding the variables. The scenario we're talking about is wandering into a supernova remnant. Several of the papers Ben cited in that video show that if the isotopes escaped the remnant, they could make it here in time. Those all came out before the paper introducing the pinball mechanics. So, let's see what we can find. This paper says the minimum safe distance of a supernova is 50 parsecs, so we'll go with that. Our solar system moves at about 828,000 kilometers per hour in relation to the galactic center. So we'll say that a supernova went off 50 parsecs in front of us and then we moved into the remnant. Now the remnant is also going to be orbiting the center of the galaxy, but since it's imaginary we don't have a real number for how fast it's going. But we do know the half-life on the isotopes, so we know how long it has to get here. So we'll use that to figure out how fast this imaginary star would have to have been orbiting the galaxy in order for us to catch up to it in time. And we'll see if that sounds like a reasonable speed or if we end up with levitating frogs again. So we'll start with Iron 60. The half-life on that is 2.6 million years. And as it happens, the dating on the samples that they've been finding recently, that they think came down to Earth just 20 years ago, is 2.6 million years. So if a supernova happened 2.6 million years ago, 50 parsecs in front of us, how much slower than us would it have to have been orbiting the galaxy in order for us to be catching up to it just now? And that is 18,000 meters per second, which means that the star was orbiting at 211,000 meters per second. So, let's go look up stellar kinematics. And that looks like a perfectly normal velocity for a star in our part of the Milky Way disk. In fact, if you flip this around and you have the supernova remnant coming at us from behind, closing the gap at the same 18,000 meters per second, then it would be moving at 248,000 meters per second, which is almost exactly the same velocity as Captain's star, one of the closest stars to us. We've come within two parsecs of it. There are also high-velocity and hypervelocity stars, which go much, much faster than normal, but the odds of one of those passing by us right after having gone supernova is pretty low. So it looks like the Iron 60 could totally have come from a supernova. What about the Aluminum 26? That has a much shorter half-life, only 717,000 years. Unfortunately, I can't find dating for the Aluminum 26 samples from the moon. I'm sure it exists, but I don't know where. I also don't know the mass of the samples, so I can't take the ejected mass predictions for various types of supernovas and run that through the half-life calculator to figure out how many half-lives have passed. And I don't know what the minimum detectable amount would be, so I can't just run it to the maximum half-lives either. So I just played around with it a bit, and it would take at least three half-lives to get us into the upper boundaries of what would be considered a normal velocity for a Milky Way disk star. That sounds perfectly reasonable, and I'm not even accounting for the fact that the remnant would expand, so it wouldn't even have to close the full 50 parsec gap. Actually, I just noticed this line in one of the studies saying that our motion relative to the local interstellar cloud, where they think all of these isotopes are coming from, is 25,000 meters per second. So I landed right in the ballpark. Hooray MS Paint math. Also, there are actually a handful of other places that Aluminum-26 can come from besides supernovas. So even if this did pencil out, that still wouldn't be smoking gun evidence. So gonna need you to show your work on this one, Ben. Anyway, that's the isotope evidence. I think it's pretty weak by itself. But when you remember that the surface of the moon is glazed, and that these isotopes were all found in that glass, it's at least worth considering. And by the way, the glazing appeared to concentrate on points and edges. In other words, areas where plasma would form in an electric field. Like St. Elmo's fire on the top of a ship's mast. Speaking of the moon, Ben has one last conspiracy theory. After the Pentagon learned about the pole flip from Project Nanook, somebody may have made the connection with a solar outburst. And one of the goals of the Apollo mission may have been to look for evidence of this on the moon. 
such as impact tracks in the lunar rocks, characteristic of dust particles accelerated to subrelativistic speeds, as opposed to ones created by cosmic rays. Some of the radio chatter from the moon landing could be interpreted this way. I don't know what this is, uh, John here at me, Houston, but I'm gonna pick it up because, uh... Anything that stares at you, you better yeah, pick it up. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a glass, but uh, in this sunlight, it's reflecting red, green, like, the, like a rainbow. Found the first prism on the moon, John. Something like that. Uh, ten rock frags, a couple of which are, uh, one of which is some interesting black glass along the sides of it. Another which is covered with black glass. And, uh, man, a little glass beads all over the place here, John. Oh, boy. That was, uh, one of those fractures that's all included with the uh, glass. Uh, okay. Yeah, so those glass uh, fracture sets. Uh, I think the after on this one will be pretty interesting. Here's a rock with glass splatter all over its body. Hey, Tony, I just picked up one that uh, is in bag 15 that is uh, has a black matrix, bluish black matrix with a lap like uh, either clasped or uh, phenocrist in it. And uh, it's right behind the limb here. I don't know whether that's what we're looking for or not. Okay, that sounds it's, good, uh, Charlie. This seems to be one of the main reasons. In fact, all these missions talk about this. They talk about this glass splatter and these glass uh, debris um, uh, samples they're picking up on the moon, which makes me believe that they were up there looking for glass splatters. They were looking for evidence of solar effects on the moon. And I think that the Chinese went up there on the far side of the moon to do exactly the same thing. Young set up an ultraviolet camera to provide the first astronomical observations from the moon. He took pictures of the Earth's upper atmosphere and magnetosphere and their interaction with the solar wind. They look like drill holes is what they look like. You do that in West Texas and you get a rattlesnake. Here you get permanently shattered soil. How about rolling that one over? No way. Whitish to gray with a lot of zap pits in it. Yeah. In fact, uh, Tony, uh, the whole area, there's a lot of this rock. There's a lot of this rock here. These are interesting because they had a glazed surface on top, a 64455 sample. It was this glazed top on it. And then in another part of that sample, there were all these pellet shots in it. So we see that these things have, have occurred not once not twice, maybe many times, that the glass splatters are happening on these rocks, and then at another time you get more of these impacts, and, and we're seeing this in these samples on the moon. I think it's a very, very strong evidence path that our sun has a micronova event and a very regular period of time, and that we're seeing these samples on the moon uh, as evidence of these events. Why did this all kick off when they came back from the moon? It's because while probably 90%, maybe more, of the glass on the moon is from meteoritic impact or from volcanism on the moon, probably, there is unquestionably these classes of glasses that are not from volcanoes and that are not from meteorite impacts, specifically the ones that have aluminum 26 the, relati the relativistic temperature required for that would require a meteor that uh, to hit the moon big enough such that we would no longer have a moon. Um, I, I, when I did the math on that, that was fun. Um, and then there's the, the super heavy elements as well. It's not just the wild isotope of aluminum, but Z110 plus elements, transuranic elements present causing these fission tracks during the cooling and solidification of this glass is indicative and many of the papers in nature indeed say that these these do not appear to be from meteorites they appear to be from something as powerful as a little nova and thomas gold specifically um, was the first to really talk about the glazing of these these lunar rocks and how yeah there are some that are clearly 
splashed with black volcanic glass or, or, or other things like that. And then there are the other ones that are not splashed with glass. The actual rock itself is glazed. Some of those don't have any zap pits in them to suggest that there was any kind of meteoritic impact anywhere near it. These are one of the final Apollo mission uh, badges on the bottom right, and not a mission badge top right, but the official logo of the Apollo program. Do we have anybody who knows anything about the gods? What did Apollo have to do with the moon? Nothing. Apollo is the sun god. It's interesting that his face is on the moon there and it's burnt orange, just as all of the ancients say happened to the moon when they blame the sun. For this, the ones who weren't facing the sun at the time described the moon turning red or turning orange or turning yellow. And of course, down there in the bottom, they were kind enough to put the four horses of the apocalypse on there in their proper colors, except only three of them are actual horses. The fourth one is, of course, the one leading the chariot known as the solar system through the galaxy. So um, at least they got the colors right. A uh, lot of evidence to suggest that uh, they got a lot of solar evidence on the moon, and that's one of the larger reasons they, uh, they kept going back and they were so interested in some of these glasses. That's interesting in itself, but then we found out that Major White worked on the Apollo missions. Yes, the unit commander from Project Nanook. According to his obituary, after that assignment he went on to a number of other roles, including as a spy master in Eastern Europe. Then after he retired from the Air Force, he joined NASA and worked on the Gemini and Apollo programs, and he left immediately after the moon landing. That is really interesting. For all my skepticism about his other theories, I have no problem with this one. This is worth noting. But getting back to the plot, we're going with it being a nova instead of a super flare. Okay, how do you cause a nova? The accepted mechanism is called accretion. Dust and gas accumulate in the solar atmosphere, and once it gets dense enough, it's absorbing enough of the star's energy that it reaches a critical temperature and the whole thing undergoes runaway fusion, which explosively ejects that whole atmosphere along with a lot of electromagnetic energy. It's worth noting this only works if the lower layer of that atmosphere is mostly hydrogen, or maybe helium, or at least something that can undergo runaway fusion. The mainstream theory on how this much dust and gas accumulates is that this only happens in binary systems, where matter from one star is being constantly fed into the atmosphere of the other star. We don't know for sure if that's always the case, and Ben proposes that you don't need a binary, you just need enough dust and gas. And he cites a number of papers providing partial support for this. There's one showing that the accretion doesn't have to be continuous, it can be sporadic as long as it's accumulating faster than the star can throw it off, and another one showing that supernova rates are higher in star-forming regions, suggesting that the higher dust and gas contents of those regions is contributing. And this one from a Japanese team where they found an almost perfectly round hole in a molecular cloud where they think a star wandered in and then novaed, potentially because of the thick dust and gas that make up the cloud. And after they found it, they went looking for more and found 27 other examples. And a handful of other papers talking about weird nova that don't really fit our expectations, just as a way of demonstrating that we don't really understand nova all that well in general. So, where would all of that dust come from to make our sun go nova? Where else but the galactic current sheet? Recall that our sun's current sheet is made up of plasma and trace amounts of other stuff that adhere to the field lines. That's all that it's made up of because there's nothing else between us and the sun. Gravity and the solar wind keep our little stellar neighborhood relatively clean. Between us and the center of the galaxy, however, there's all kinds of dust and gas and plasma and ions and isotopes and particulate matter in general that will adhere to the ripples of the current sheet. Ben compares it to a Swiffer duster. So in addition to hitting us with a magnetic reversal, it also hits us with a giant wall of dust. Now you might ask, if that's true, shouldn't we see a giant wall of dust coming? Well, first of all, Ben proposes that the local interstellar cloud moving at us from the direction of the galactic center might be just that. But even so, the answer is not necessarily. This picture is an artist's rendition. We're actually pretty bad at seeing dust in the interstellar medium. There are always multiple ripples between us and the galactic center, so the distortion we're seeing in that direction wouldn't change. I would expect, however, that as we start to get really enveloped by it, objects at wider angles relative to the galactic disk would start to show increased distortion and reddening. But there's another possibility besides overwhelming amounts of dust. Since the current sheet is mostly plasma with an electric current running through it, and the sun is made of plasma, it will induce an electric current in the sun. And another one of Ben's ideas is that this, combined with the field reversal, could cause solar plasma instabilities, 
that could subdue sunspot activity and the solar wind, to the point where even the regular dust that we encounter would start accumulating in the solar atmosphere and trigger this in a relatively short period of time. I don't think he's ever gone into detail on the solar physics of why he thinks that would happen, other than that it has something to do with enhanced plasma density and the sun's weakening magnetic field, but assuming it could, that would definitely be the simplest mechanism. There's also this paper he brings up a lot that talks about triggering what is effectively a nova using a black hole. It talks about a star that's undergoing tidal disruption, which means the black hole is tearing it apart, spaghettifying it, and that during that process, the gravity of the black hole could compress the plasma and trigger explosive thermonuclear reactions that would effectively look the same as a nova. Ben says you could do the same thing with plasma instabilities, and he's never explained it, but I assume he's talking about something like a Z-pinch instability, where the magnetic fields compress the plasma. We use the same principle in fusion reactors. So you'd be doing the compression with magnetic fields instead of gravity. I find it more difficult to picture magnetic forces triggering runaway nuclear synthesis on the surface of a star in such a way that it would produce an explosive outburst similar to a nova than I do with a black hole ripping the whole thing apart, but the detailed mechanics of that would be well above my head. This also wouldn't result in the sun turning red, so if not on a scientific basis, I would not favor this theory on the basis of the prophecy, unless accretion was already in progress and this just set it off early. But anyway, those are his three ideas on how to trigger a recurrent micronova. By the way, if you look up micronova, you're not going to find anything. That's a term a small handful of people are using, but it's not a novel concept. Dwarf nova and the nova element of type 1 x-ray bursts are actually smaller than what we're talking about. And we've seen sun-like stars give off flares that are the same energy level as what we're expecting. So the size isn't really a significant disputed factor. It's whether or not you can have a recurrent nova without a binary. Now, there should be one more question you're asking. Even if we don't see a wall of dust coming at us, if the current sheet can actually induce this kind of thing in a star, shouldn't we see at least some of the stars between us and the center of the galaxy undergoing some kind of change like novaing or flaring in a chain, one after the other, coming toward us? We have seen that the stars towards the galactic center have been activating in a line towards the sun, implying the current sheet radial outward effect, and today, we confirm that A.D. Leonis is activating. A.D. Leonis is not towards the center of the galaxy or away. It's pretty much right in line in terms of distance away from the center, but it's situated way up in the northern part of the sky from Earth's perspective. At only 16 light years away, it's a great hold the line candidate as it stands equal distance as the sun does from the galactic core, but as a smaller, more easily activated M star, the sun will take a bit more time and likely the full galactic field reversal moment to activate. The only reason Wolf 359 isn't listed among Barnard, Proxima, and AD Leo in the list of nearby stars outbursting is because we only had the one study saying it had a super flare. This is now confirmed with its activation continuing, super flares now occurring regularly on the fifth closest star to ours, and indeed, it's in the direction of the galactic center. So Barnard's star was thought to be inactive. They thought it was too old and rotated too slowly to be a flaring star. Then suddenly one day in 2004, it just came to life. Now that's six light years away, so for us to be seeing it in 2004, it would have to have happened in 1998. Then in 2019, we saw two more sizable flares come off of it, which would have happened in 2013. Proxima Centauri, in March 2016, we saw a flare ten times stronger than anything we'd seen from it before. That one's four light years away, so it would have happened in 2012. Then in May 2019, another report came out that said, it was still flaring, not quite as strong, but significantly more than would be expected, again, for a star of that age. Now, the impression I got is that we don't have a lot of observational evidence for that one before 2016, so maybe it's always been doing that? I'm not sure. But the one in 2016 could be seen with the naked eye, and that doesn't appear to have happened before. A.D. Leonis had a definite increase in activity somewhere between 2006 and 2018. That one is 16 light years away, so that would have been somewhere between 1990 and 2002. Wolf 359, I can't confirm if there was any new or unique activity in 2020 because I'm not paying to read this paper and the abstract really doesn't tell me anything. I know it's been frequently flaring since at least 2017, and I get the impression it's always done that, but assuming there was an uptick in 2020, that one is about 8 light years away, so that would have started in 2012. Ben says that all of these flares could be Nova. We can't really tell the difference with our technology. And he made these pictures to try to give you a visualization of where everything is. They're not great, so I tried to find a better one. Here's one from NASA. He was actually mistaken about Wolf. It's not between us and the galaxy. It's slightly behind us, off to the side. This one doesn't have Leonis on it, so I found this one from University of Puerto Rico, which I've helpfully marked up. It's not what it looks like, though. The angles appear to be correct if we assume that we're looking at the galaxy from a top-down perspective. 
but the distances are not. Leonis, for example, is 16 light years away, but not horizontally. It's only about 8 or 9 light years horizontally. The rest is vertical distance. So this is more of a graph than a map. Here's a 3D model I found, but this is from a science fiction website, so it may not be accurate, but you get the idea. So if we include Leonis and Wolf, that's not quite one after the other in a row, but that does make sense. In this video, Ben explains why factors like the star's size, age, magnetic field strength, rotation speed, metallicity, and how it's moving in relation to the current sheet would all influence how long it takes for them to be affected. All of these are red dwarfs, for example, and smaller than the sun. They probably have weaker magnetic fields, too. That could explain why we haven't been affected yet. So we can't really use this to make a timeline, but it is another tiny piece of circumstantial evidence. Now, having established all of that background, we can finally, finally talk about all of the different ways you can create global earthquakes with this toolkit. I've been focusing completely on crustal displacement, and how that works is kind of obvious. There's still going to be some friction between the crust and the mantle, so it's going to be a bumpy ride. And since the Earth is oblate, the radius at the equator is greater than the poles. So as the land slides over the equator, it'll be getting stretched out, and as it slides over the poles, it'll be getting compressed and bunched up. Which, in addition to earthquakes, will create all kinds of fissures and mountains erupting. I haven't explained why we think this is where the poles are going to end up, so I guess this is a good place to do that. Chan Thomas picked the Bay of Bengal Basin because of the geological evidence. He didn't go into great detail about why, but the predicted cycle that he ended up with had it landing there next. The Rand Corporation expected the geographic pole to end up wherever the magnetic pole did, and as it happens, both magnetic poles appear to be moving toward the Bay of Bengal. Now, I said before that the magnetization of the crust was probably not enough to overcome the friction between the crust and the mantle and allow it to unlock. However, once it's unlocked, it's probably enough to guide it into a particular orientation. So I think the Rand Corporation had it correct, and this is where the poles are going to be, roughly. For these maps, I just picked an arbitrary spot in that location and drew the Arctic Circle to scale around it. Anyway, Ben has put forward three other theories for the direct mechanism of disaster. The simplest one he calls lithospheric heaving, and the best way to explain that would just be to show you the experiments they did in Billy Elverton's homemade plasma lab. As you're watching this, keep in mind how much water and conductive crystal there is in the crust and mantle. We're going to look at some more stuff from Billy's lab right now. We're going to be investigating the effects of electric current on water and the number one upper mantle mineral content, and that is olivine and its water-rich polymorphs. So this is going to be the effects of electric current on water and olivine. Now, these are done in the lab, and here's what you'll have to remember. Water is more volatile and olivine more conductive at mantle conditions than it is here in the lab. So anything that we see here will be equaled or amplified under the mantle conditions with that pressure, the temperature, etc. So this stuff is really cool. He started without any arc. That is a drop of water. This is not sound vibration. This is not cymatics. This is just electric current in dark mode. Before we saw it in lightning mode, discharge, arc mode where you could see it, that whitish, purplish plasma. Here, he just didn't turn up the power enough to do it, because if you actually do get an arc discharge, all the vibration and cymatic patterns disappear. Uh, so we're going to zoom in a little bit on it here when he turns on the current. All that is is an electrode. But you should be able to see how the water is sort of rippling around and, and moving. Uh, it happened too quick there for you to see, but when there was a little lightning bolt, everything went calm for a moment. But there's more than just the shaking, because when we get to real, real power, and this is just water with some pyronine added for, for visual effect, water will attract, will, will, will be attracted to this current. Water will get pulled by the current. So you could see there, the, water was, the, the current was just going into the crack, the low resistivity zone, like it's supposed to. But the water knew this was going on, and the water wanted to come be a part of it. Now watch this. This is how attractive current is to water. It is painting the fault lines of the rock with the pyrene. Now think about this at the scale of the Pacific Ocean, at the scale of enormous plates. But if you're going to be thinking about it at that scale, we might want to think about, well, okay, it cannot just be attractive, but look at how it's pushed out among the lightning bolts. Now granted, we don't have literal lightning underground, although some folks at the USGS are actually starting to think we do. This is really cool. Watch what happens. So much for gravity. When we hit the uh, current, that water starts pushing up on the sandstone. 
Now you start to think of this over the scale of a country, over thousands of miles. These tiny, subtle effects of water pushing up or pushing down or side to side. This is all Levine crystals right here, and they can shimmy a little bit on charging, but when Billy goes to discharge them, that's when we really see the action. They self-translocate relative to one another as they are discharging their electricity. We'll just watch a little bit more of this here because it is super cool. And so as you can see, you know, he'll, he'll nudge some and they'll, they'll jostle, but what that is is that's a grounding rod. He's grounding them. He is discharging all of the electricity that he fired in. Now, what I didn't show was he spent about 60 seconds to two minutes firing 70,000 volts into these crystals. So these things aren't just, you can't just grab a bunch of olivine and go do this on your table. We charge them up just like they would if they were introduced to electric current down in the mantle, an extra pressure, an extra temperature, things of that nature. This is really cool. So no current right now. And as we turn the current on, the olivine acts like a magnetic field and starts spinning the water around it. Do you see the particles in the water spinning? That's just the current hitting the olivine. So we have water in these subducted crusts. The number one mineral component of the mantle is olivine. And look at how they react to electricity. And that's how you get big chunks of continents rising and sinking into the ocean. That would give us the earthquakes and some tsunamis. But since the ice caps don't get moved down to the poles, it probably wouldn't give us enough rain to match the vision of the tip of the spear. You can incorporate this into any of the other three theories, though. The next one involves what's called the Genebekov effect. And the easiest way to explain that is to just show it to you. You see how this handle has a stable rotation, then suddenly flips 180 degrees and resumes a stable rotation for a while? That's the Genebekov effect. Now pretend the end of that T is the North Pole. This only works in things that effectively have a third axis. But remember back when I was talking about Hapgood and he brought up the idea of a third axis composed of surface features? It turns out there's more to that than just surface features. There are these big blobs of stuff coming out of the core going into the mantle called Large Low Shear Velocity Provinces, or LLSVPs for short. We don't know much about them. We only know that they exist through seismic tomology, which is where we track seismic waves moving through the Earth. And we found that they move slower through these areas, hence the name Low Velocity. We know that they're made up of something different than the mantle surrounding them, and some people think they're highly conductive. One of them is roughly below the South Atlantic Anomaly. They also roughly come out on opposite sides of the core, kind of like handlebars, thus forming a third axis. But clearly they are not symmetrical or especially well balanced. Also, the core itself might be lopsided? In the general direction of the Bay of Bengal, no less. Ben has a couple of times entertained the idea of the Earth turning over 180 degrees from something like this. It's probably his least favored theory. It doesn't explain any of the geological evidence. It also wouldn't involve much in the way of earthquakes other than through lithospheric heaving. And since the ice caps don't melt, you don't get the torrential rain. So it doesn't fit the vision of the tip of the sphere all that well either. He mostly brings this up as a potential component of the solar-induced length of day glitches. That both their conductivity and imbalance could contribute to that last big push that unlocks the crust. There's one more idea he came up with just within the last year. It was something that came to him while pondering the so-called rare cosmological event. What you got on the left there is a piece of muscovite mica. And this was taken here on Earth. It is only the third ever found rare cosmological event, they say. I'm not sure I like the name. But they say that they're so rare and they're so hard to find because in every whole crystal there would only be one of them. And they only find them at the exact dead centers of the crystals. They're away from the outside. There is no evidence of there being penetrating cosmic rays or anything like that. All of the black stuff around there, those are normal fission tracks. That's real cosmic rays. That's what cosmic rays look like when they hit. But there's this exclusion zone around what they call the rare cosmological event, and they don't have an explanation for it because they know for a fact that it's not electrons or positrons. They know it's not cosmic ray because there's, there's no fan out to, to uh, basically a single twist, and they're far away from the outside of the crystal. All of the ones they've seen here are found exactly in the dead center of the crystal, and they represent a residually input positive charge 
that didn't discharge outward, but it discharged from the center. And it looks exactly like the cosmic jet that blasts out of a star when it's born. It looks like the cosmic jets that you see from the center of a galaxy when it eats a star or something like that. They are certain, absolutely certain, and um, th this comes from a fair amount of study of the previous two rare cosmological events, that again, these are not cosmic rays, they are not electrons or positrons, they do know that it has to be a cosmological event because there is nothing on Earth that would have done this. And so how do you get a residual positive charge to basically bathe a crystal such that it takes it in and it can't discharge it out? It's still, it's still bathed in the stuff. It has to discharge in the center. There's actually missing atoms in the center. Now, they're not really missing. They just blew apart and they blew, they blew north and south, just like a cosmic jet does. It's really quite wonderful um, to, to see that. And I, I would argue that, while not definitive, um, something tremendous from the sun is not a terrible first hypothesis. His idea is, what if the same thing happened inside of the Earth, that we were bombarded with so much energy from the sun that too much accumulated in the core and it had no way out, so it erupted along the toroidal field lines north and south, and in the process, ejected material from the core along with it? What if this is how the LLSVPs were formed? Now, if this energy at the same time dissolves the existing LLSVPs, and he's never really gone into detail about how it would do that, I think he said thermally and electrically, but where would it dissolve to? Back into the core, I guess? But with them gone, there would now be this internal imbalance of weight parallel to the axis of rotation. This would cause the axis to wobble and eventually turn over 90 degrees until it settled with the greatest mass perpendicular to the rotational axis, as would happen in any spinning object. So in this scenario, the entire planet turns over 90 degrees instead of the crust unlocking. That gives you the flooding, and the massive changes to the internal structure of the Earth give you a lot of lithospheric heaving. And in fact, since the Earth's obliquity is now in the wrong place, I imagine there would be a lot of resettling in the subsequent years, as the poles flattened and the bulge returned to the equator. Tilting the entire planet does have some advantages in terms of the geological evidence. I think I lean more toward crustal displacement personally, but this is a neat idea. And there you have it. The only mechanisms for causing global earthquakes and flooding that have any science behind them whatsoever. If I were judging this just on the basis of the science, I would probably say that this sounds compelling, there's a lot of interesting circumstantial evidence, and I would definitely be paying attention to how it develops, but it probably wouldn't be enough for me to really believe in it. It's the prophecy aspect, the fact that it fits so well with the Fatima material, that really puts it over the edge for me. Again, I doubt that it works exactly like this, you never get all of it right, but this is about as plausible a mechanism as we could ever ask for. There's a whole bunch of other smaller aspects of this that Suspicious Observers talks about. Changes in the ionosphere and the climate, all kinds of anthropological evidence that I'm not even going to touch. How the inventory Stella describes the back of the Sphinx's headdress getting knocked off by lightning, and Dr. Robert Schock finding what looks like a vitrification scar right behind it from giant planetary scale lightning, the flash frozen mammoths, which may not actually be a thing, apparent crustal shift on Mars, the fact that there might be a pattern to who's on the sun-facing side of the Earth when the nova goes off, and that next time it would be Africa, Europe, and the western Middle East, record levels of cosmic rays possibly causing people to act crazy, but I think this has gone on long enough. If you're interested, watch the channel. I certainly will continue to do so. For now, I'm going to take a long break, because I've been working on this for over a year and a half, and I really need to get to some other projects. God bless, guys. Or maybe I should close with eyes open, no fear. Take care.